Hello, YouTubers. This is another session in our podcast series where we get to talk to amazing pioneers in the tech industry from all over the world. Today, I am joined by a person that I really, really admire, an amazing, intelligent principal engineer at Microsoft, uh, Maria Mikhailova. Am I saying it right? Yes, Maria is is one of the uh, lead engineers that is driving uh, quantum computing, you know, a programming language called Q Sharp. Uh, that Microsoft has developed and you know you might have heard about it you know every now and then you know it's still super futuristic you know there are even people out there that are talking about quantum security you know how do how do we kind of jump into that next level a next layer of kind of you know computing in in the tech industry you know I think quantum computing Maria correct me if I'm wrong quantum computing would make computing today look like uh, I don't know like uh, like writing on paper the difference between automating you know kind of translating data versus actually doing Doing it by hand or something like that. What do you think about that? Nothing wrong with writing on paper. It definitely has its uses. That's the thing about quantum computing. It's not going to replace all classical computing. Same okay. as, well, I don't know about you, but I still write my shopping list by hand. Nothing okay. wrong with that. All right. Okay. I, I don't know if anyone would understand if I wrote anything by hand. I try to sign, you know, some things for people, but they'd be like, I may as well be a doctor because we have no idea what you're, <laughs> you know, how doctors like, imagine if doctors went out on a protest and they just wrote there their demands. Nobody really is going to know <laughs> what they're asking for. Anyway, quantum computing is great. But, you know, as is the case with, with these podcast series, you know, we, we always talk about, you know the individuals the, the 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 people the persons behind the technology you know where did they come from how did they grow up you know what were their ambitions and dreams and hopes you know what is the secret behind their success just a little bit about yourself without mentioning quantum computing you can't mention quantum computing just you <laughs> go ahead go ahead this is a bit of a challenge but less of a challenge than it would be if i was trained in the fields that we should not mention. So I'm uh, originally from, from Ukraine. Okay. Uh, grew up uh, in a family where my mother was a software engineer and my grandmother was a software engineer, nice. one of the first software engineers in Ukraine. Nice. So I had my role models right in front of me since I was a kid. So I figured out I want to be a software engineer pretty early on. There was a brief span of uh, considering a spy career because apparently I'm not memorable enough to uh, be recognized even by people I talk to every day in a crowd. So <laughs> let's fix that. <laughs> a good Together. number two career, I would say. Right. But then I got more practical and uh, settled on uh, software engineering. So yeah. I um, got my uh, master's degree from uh, university back in Kiev. Uh, it was called Applied Mass, Applied Informatics, which translates to US computer science. Mm -hmm. uh, surprisingly, it had, a, it had a lot of physics, including a bit of quantum physics. Oh. which is okay to mention because it is not exactly the field that we shall not name. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but uh, it was a very physical approach to it. Nobody said that you can uh, do computation using it. And uh, it was completely unclear to me that you can make a career out of it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So initially I didn't. I went ahead to graduate, uh, spent a couple of years working in Ukrainian uh, companies working on banking software. Mm -hmm. And then um, I interviewed for Microsoft to move to US and uh, join Microsoft. That okay. worked out surprisingly well. I didn't really believe that uh, I'm kind of clever enough to join Microsoft because, you know, everybody knows what kind of company Microsoft is, and it's amazing. And certainly I cannot be good enough for it. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, in parallel with my studies and with my uh, work, I spent quite a lot of time on programming competitions, uh, first as a participant and then as problem writer, setting up the problems that other people solve. And that is incredibly useful in programming interviews. First, because the uh, 
questions they ask you in interviews are very similar. And second, because you are used to the pressure, you are used to having three problems so to solve in one hour, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that really helped me during the interviews. Really helps when you show up to an interview and you're asked a dynamic programming question and you just know what dynamic programming is and how it works. Just off the top, just I know what it is. Don't worry, I got you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, so Marit, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So I uh, passed the interviews, uh, got hired, moved to US um, about ten years ago. Now I'm going to have my ten year anniversary in October. Congratulations! All right. Thank Here, you. Here's here's for another hundred. <laughs> Well, a hundred might be stretching it. From what I see on LinkedIn, people tend to retire after 25, 30 years. So a hundred might be a bit of a stretch. So it's a little bit of a stretch. Okay. Maybe maybe we can, I don't know, maybe we can explore the quantum realm and, you know, the quantum dimension. I don't know. I'm just saying things I heard in the Marvel movie. I don't know much about it. You're going to educate me today. Educate all of us today. Anyway, <laughs> 10 years. Okay, great. Great. Mm -hmm. So I have I have a question for you. Like, um, what really gravitated you towards quantum physics? You know, I don't assume like, you know, you know, you wake up one day and be like, you know what, I'm gonna do quantum physics because it's cool. <laughs> you know, tell me what what got you into this? Like, how did you? Was this by choice, kind of fate? You know, things just got together and you found yourself there. Tell us the story. Yeah, I think it's most, uh, mostly the latter. I would love to think that it's fate, but I'm not uh, uh -huh. uh, self-assured enough for that. So probably it was just a good old accident. So I spent the first four and a bit years in Microsoft working in classical teams, in Bing, infrastructure, autopilot, if you're familiar with the team. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm you? not going to say anything. This is a public podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, it's it's really good that a quantum computer scientist or computation scientist have worked on autopilot. Great. <laughs> that's that's a story to tell. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, and then in another team in uh, Cosmos internals, working on an Apache open source project, Reef. Okay. Uh, and then at some point about six years ago, I started to look for another adventure. Ideally something that uh, would use more of the mathematical skills I learned at university. Mm -hmm. And uh, a friend of mine who is a proper quantum computing researcher has a PhD and worked in the team longer than I did. Uh, told me that they were looking for uh, classically trained software engineers to work on the compiler for the language that later became P Sharp. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was the first time I think when the team was looking for people without quantum computing background. So okay. it sounded fascinating. I looked it up. It looked even more fascinating. <laughs> so I went ahead and uh, interviewed for that one too. There was another dynamic programming question. And surprisingly, there was one question on physics, but fortunately not on quantum physics. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> so, so, so here's a here's a question for you. I see you authored a book in Q Sharp, which is a programming language. We can talk about it now because you know we can't, right? So, you you authored a book about this. Q Sharp is just for the people watching. You know, Q Sharp is a programming language. You know how you have C Sharp? There's Q Sharp. It's for quantum programming, right? You authored a book about Q Sharp. And this doesn't come by accident. This is passion. This is dedication. This is a lot of things. And and this is a this is a recent book too, Maria, right? This is you just released that, right? Yes, it, it just went out a couple months ago this summer. Well, first of all, congratulations. You know, Thank I have you. to say this, it's really inspiring just to see people still kind of, you know, it takes a lot of dedication. You're pouring your heart out and you're putting something out there. How, like, like how did you develop this passion to build something like that or write something like that and get so immersed? Like not every quantum uh, uh, computer scientist, you know, goes out there and writes a book or gets so immersed into it to the point where they want to kind of, it takes a lot of effort and dedication 
what happened there? Like, you know, things got together and now you have this position. Did you just wake up one day and said, you know what, I'm going to write a book about Q Sharp. How did that happen? <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I would say that this was a lucky combination of several factors. Okay. On one hand, English is, of course, not my first language, not even my second language. Okay. Uh, but I uh, started learning it very early, I think, since when I was five, mm -hmm. because my mother insisted very much that it's a really good language for your future and for your career, and she was completely right in this. Mm -hmm. So I've been practicing reading and then writing English for a very long time. Okay. And uh, then at some point, so it was kind of always interesting for me to share my knowledge with other people. Mm -hmm. But initially, I started, of course, with small blog posts about programming competitions, for example. Then when I joined this team about uh, uh, quantum computing, I write some things for Q -sharp developer blog. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, uh, at some point, I discovered uh, a passion in me for the work that I'm doing right now, education and outreach. Mm -hmm. So helping people learn quantum computing and ideally making it interesting. Mm -hmm. And so I kept practicing in helping people learn uh, public speaking, mm -hmm. writing. Uh, I actually taught a course at Northeastern University, also nice. about quantum computing, of course. Nice. Nice. We are allowed to mention these words now, right? Yes. We are at this point of my career, yeah. at which I sort of cannot talk about it without mentioning it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, so, so you just felt like you have this passion. By the way, just, just so you know, there is such a, you know, it's really, really rare to find a tech advocate for quantum computing, right? Like you could search, it's mostly kind of theoretical, you know, it, it's not mainstream yet. So kind of take it like this is an under, a huge undertaking. Like you're basically going and saying this is a topic that is not very commonly discussed, not super mainstream. There's only a handful of people, you know, in every every corporate, every now, maybe a couple of hundred, you know, here and there that would understand something like that. And you want to take this mainstream. You want people to actually like Q Sharp and understand quantum computing. Was that kind of a part of your motive? Yes, that's part of Microsoft's uh, agenda overall. Mm -hmm. So we are not only building a full stack quantum system to help us solve the problems of tomorrow. We also need to build up a workforce that is going to be solving those problems of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It would be extremely disappointing to build this incredibly complicated quantum system, the quantum computer with all the pieces moving flawlessly and the software for it, and then just find ourselves with nobody able to program it, nobody able to use all this achievement to solve actual problems. Okay. Okay. So, so, so let me ask you this then, why would someone who knows C sharp today, and this is for the majority of my audience, really, I'm a .NET C sharp developer. Why do I need to learn Q sharp today? Um, the answer is twofold to some extent. On one hand, you might want to join the quantum computing world okay. if you find that it is interesting to you and if you find the area of your existing skills that you can apply to it, this uh -huh. is absolutely a path you can take, pretty much like I did. Okay. Uh, a lot of people who join quantum computing world these days are not necessarily uh, trained in quantum physics or theoretical quantum algorithms. Okay. Instead, we can see people who worked in compilers, for example, for their whole life, mm -hmm. who bring in their compiler skills into developing the software stack mm -hmm. for the quantum computer. Okay. We can see people who worked on Azure services, for example, who bring in their skills to build up Azure Quantum as a service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, there are all kinds of examples in which you don't necessarily have to be incredibly deep in quantum computing to contribute to it. You can bring in a different skill and that will be the value because people who are theoretical physicists, most likely they don't know how to write compilers or okay. they might figure out how to do it, but they might not be the best compiler writers in the world. 
Okay, that's that's the folks that develop the technology. What about the folks that consume the technology? How smart do they need to be to use it? The workforce part, the people that will actually take it and go build business applications with it. Mm -hmm. I think that's still an open question. So uh, there are a, lo a lot of people out there who are looking at what are the applications of quantum computing going to be. Mm -hmm. Some of the domains we know are going to be good, or at least we expect are going to be good, are things such as quantum chemistry, modeling the materials. Mm -hmm. And that area, it requires, uh, as far as I understand, pretty deep um, familiarity with chemistry. chemistry. Because yeah. if you want to model a molecular, you want to understand things about molecules. Like, mm -hmm. what is it that you're trying to solve? Yeah. How to formulate your problem in terms of chemistry and then how to translate it into quantum computing. Yeah, yeah. But then we all very much hope that this is not going to be the only problems for which quantum computing is good. Yeah, yeah. What, what I'm hearing, I'll tell you my part, like what I'm hearing in the market, security, quantum security, you know, how can you, you know, secure, uh, security is always a big pro problem and a big, you know, like right now, cybersecurity in the tech markets, 23 million, 23 million, uh, or 2 million, 2 million open opportunities for people to kind of go out there and, you know, explore cybersecurity. Nobody wants to do cybersecurity because I guess it doesn't have the, the flashy, nice UI and the crazy back end and doing stuff like that. But some people feel gravitated towards it. Do you, do you think quantum computing could help yeah. in security? Uh, there are definitely applications that are going to be useful there, such as uh, quantum communications, for example, protocols for uh, generating uh, keys mm -hmm. in a secure manner, like physically secure manner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like like tokens and stuff like that, the secure private public keys and mm -hmm. all that. Yes, so okay. sh shared, key shared key generations that you can then use in other uh, applications so so for for the okay so so just that one step backwards you know the for in the chemical field and the chemistry field you know just understanding problems like this would this be something that you know scientists would use to kind of expedite you know producing uh, yeah I, I don't know medications like something to solve issues like covid for instance or you know uh, viral diseases and things like that would would that be helpful in that um okay so, uh a mandatory disclaimer that I'm not a chemistry or modeling expert, yep. but from what I understand, um, quantum computing can help in certain types of these problems to basically speed up the experimentation. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. it will be able to uh, experiment with to model various potential um, chemicals. Uh, mm -hmm and figure out their properties without actually creating them and running like chemical experiments on them. Mm -hmm. So it will be able to rule out some of the possibilities and mm -hmm. narrow down the field of search for which we want to go and do experiments mm -hmm. to much narrower things. So we will, would be looking at 10 possibilities instead of millions of possibilities. I see. I always hear speed about quantum computing, like whatever computers can do today, you know, quantum computing is faster. Is there anything other than just faster that quantum computing can get, can get, can, can provide in the, in the computing world? So the most interesting applications of quantum computing are the ones in which we don't have a feasible classical solution for these mm -hmm. problems. So mm -hmm. if there is a classical solution right now that our computers or supercomputers can do, mm -hmm. then uh, quantum computing is not necessarily going to help you. It's not going to help you, you know, sort out your email faster, which is a problem we're all facing on a daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but for problems for which we don't have classical solutions right now, that's where it's going to be interesting. Okay. Because performing computations themselves on a quantum computer is going to be slower than on a classical one. Mm. So if you are looking at an algorithm that gives you, for example, a quadratic speed up mm -hmm. uh, in terms of asymptotics, in terms of the number of operations performed, mm -hmm. that advantage might very well be eaten up just by the speed of individual operations. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. So you want to find algorithms for which your speed up is ideally exponential. So right. that even with individual operations being slower, mm -hmm. you still get enough of an advantage to make the problem from completely infeasible to solve to feasible to solve in a couple of days. Okay. okay. So it's those kinds of problems we are looking at. Interesting. Here's, here's another question I have. Do you feel like quantum computing is like like the next stage like there will be a time where our phones our personal computers our servers everything is going to be running quantum and classic computers are just going to fade away from the picture i don't think this is how uh, we look at this i don't think anybody in the field thinks this okay. so first of all classical computers are perfectly good for a lot of purposes yep like checking a mail running your phone running yep. this meeting yep uh, and those applications are not going to be improved by quantum computing okay okay uh, so quantum computing is more of a next step for supercomputing ah, supercomputers uh -huh. are not something that most people in the world use on a daily basis mm -hmm. they're not going to power your uh, smartphones mm -hmm. but for those very specialized problems that require massive computations massive computational power Okay. That's where quantum computing is going to come into life. So it is going to impact our lives, we assume, we expect. Okay. But it's not going to be that kind of direct impact. Everybody carries a quantum computer in their, in their pocket. Okay. Instead, it's going to be this um, somewhat raw indirect impact in which you use materials that were designed using quantum computing. Nice. You... Uh, rely on things that were done using quantum computing but you don't necessarily carry it in your pocket and you don't necessarily use it yourself got it like weather prediction do you think quantum computer would help with something like that that one i think is an open question i haven't heard of anything definite in that area okay okay let's go back to you a little bit right what's your what's your ambitions and dreams you know with the world of computation, you know, let's say in the next five to 10 years, what do you uh, dream to achieve on a personal level, you know, kind of applying your own mind? I know you're, you know, you're, you're writing books, you're going out there and you're kind of advocating for this. What's the next step for you? Oh, that's a good question. We, we, we need a quantum computer for that one. <laughs> go, go yeah, kind of questions about quantum computing are easy. Questions about the next five years are complicated. Somehow, at no point in my life would I be able to answer this five-year question, what are you going to be doing in the five years? What do you see yourself doing in five years? With any degree of accuracy at all. Yes. Because yeah. somehow just about every four or five years my Your career, career takes <laughs> a turn that i couldn't predict right right <laughs> so it's it's really hard to predict but maybe at, on the terms of dreams just patterns like you must at some point in time said okay you know i'm doing this today right um here's where i want to take this to the next level right uh, there's always that next level next big thing you know, that you want to bring into, you know, your life as a way to kind of apply yourself, you know, kind of a way to kind of say, no, here's my signature. Here's my way of putting a dent in the universe and saying, I am here. This is my creation. This is my invention. Anything like that, Maria? <laughs> well, if I'm being really selfish and completely unrealistic, mm -hmm. I would really love uh, people, students all over the world to use the approaches that i bring in education to learn about quantum computing okay uh, my kind of keystone project is uh, the project called quantum katas okay. they are a collection of quantum programming exercises okay. for learning quantum computing and quantum okay. programming okay and i came up with the idea based on how i learned quantum computing Mm -hmm. I learned it based on a book and based on some lectures that our teammates gave to us when we joined the team. Okay. And I am this a software is the one engineer, for you, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Yep. 
Yep, keep going. I'm sorry. I'm just showing it to people while we're talking. Mm -hmm. Of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, a, I'm an engineer by training and by kind of approach of thinking. It's really hard for me to um, remember things that are done as a lecture mm -hmm. and to kind of believe them, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I can do the pen and paper exercises. That's basically another wonderful application of pen and paper approach. Nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But then uh, to properly understand an algorithm, you need to implement it. Okay. You cannot uh, say that you're a software engineer if you've only implemented algorithms on paper. You have, you have you to just can't. materialize it somehow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's why I came up with this project. So on one hand, it gives you programming problems to try and solve, mm -hmm. which is another thing that is uh, relatively rare in quantum computing right now. Mm -hmm. uh, all resources follow a certain set of uh, algorithms, but they don't give you a lot of problems to practice on. Okay. Like there is a teleportation algorithm, but it's always the same. Right. There is not a thousand problems that allow you to practice this, unlike, for example, dynamic programming in classic uh, world. And on the other hand, you get those problems, you can try and solve them, and then you get feedback. There is an automated uh, testing harness that runs your solution mm -hmm. and tells you right away, right or wrong, okay. so that you know that you understood this uh, correctly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is incredibly helpful. So for me, when I was doing my pen and paper exercises, I needed somebody to check that I'm correct. So I had to set up an ambush in Microsoft Kitchen. That was way before the pandemic, so it was a thing. Uh -huh. And I would wait uh, for a quantum computing researcher to walk in, unsuspectingly. And you catch? <laughs> and I catch them and I ask them whether my solution is correct. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. And, but I think you can see that this kind of approach is not exactly scalable. And mm -hmm. it is not possible to apply for people who don't have a kitchen with uh, high amounts of food traffic from quantum computing researchers. <laughs> Which is most of the world, realistically. Right, right. <laughs> So you need to be able to get feedback about your solutions. Mm -hmm. And this is the kind of uh, approach that uh, this project offers you. Okay. And I would really love to see more uh, people worldwide doing this kind of thing when they teach quantum computing and when they learn quantum computing. Okay. I heard a terrifying story a couple of years ago from somebody who took a class on quantum computing and everything they did, all the exercises, they did on paper. Oh, that, uh, that doesn't mean anything. It doesn't translate and it doesn't sell. You, you can't sell that, right? Mm. It's not even about selling it. It's about uh, not using the great tools that are at your disposal now. Yeah. So 10 years ago, you wouldn't have quantum programming languages as widespread yep. as they are now. Five yep. years ago, when I was learning, we, there wouldn't be as many educational materials as there are now. And of course, there wouldn't be that wonderful project that I came up with because I came up with it only four years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But but now there's really no excuse to stick to the purely theoretical explanation. Yeah. Because it, it just doesn't give you the feel for the algorithm. Yeah. For example, the first time I implemented a Grover search algorithm, one of the most fundamental algorithms in quantum computing and extremely well known, mm -hmm. uh, I implement, and it's an iterative uh, algorithm, so it mm -hmm. requires a certain number of iterations. So I implemented it, and coming from a classical background, I figured that the more iterations, the better. Yeah. Right? That's, yep. that's what you do. You just yeah, you iterate do. as yeah. much as you can. Yeah. But for this algorithm, it's not correct. So it gave me completely random results, and I spent a day figuring it out. And for this algorithm, you need to do, there is an optimal number of operations, mm -hmm. iterations you need to do. Mm -hmm. You do more than that, and your success probability starts to decrease. But uh, then it starts uh, to increase again. Yeah. And this kind of thing, you're not going to uh, just look at the mass and just say, oh, 
Yes, of course. Obviously, that's what it does. Mm -hmm. It's just not going to happen. You need yep. to actually implement it and spend a little time experimenting with it. Okay, okay. Here's, and I, here's... I encounter this, this kind of misconception about this algorithm all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, l let me ask you this. You said I want all schools, everybody, you know, all, all students in schools to learn about uh, quantum programming, quantum computing. Um, do you think it's important for everyone in the tech industry to have at least, you know, a, a bare minimum knowledge about what quantum computing is, play around with it and try it at least for a while to see if they can kind of use that tool to solve a problem that they have today or in the future? Um, I think this brings us beautifully to the second uh, reason I think learning quantum computing is interesting. Mm -hmm. It is a wonderful way to expand your thinking and to make yourself a better thinker. Okay. Uh, I've seen this with uh, any uh, different computing paradigms, not just quantum computing necessarily, mm -hmm. but for example, functional programming. Mm -hmm. If you have a problem, even the same program, a problem you had uh, approaching imperative programming, mm -hmm. uh, you need to think about it differently, to express mm -hmm. it in terms of a different paradigm. Mm -hmm. You need to just twist your brain into using different primitives mm -hmm. than what you used before. Mm -hmm. And this kind of exercise, it's like crosswords for the brain except I don't really like crosswords. <laughs> you don't like Wordle or anything like that? <laughs> oh, I, love, I love the Wordle. And you like Wordle? Into crosswords. words I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think we can use quantum computing to beat Wordle <laughs> every day? <laughs> I don't know, maybe. I, don't know. I have seen projects that implemented quantum variation of Wordle. Oh my god. In multiple ways, either working with letters using quantum computing or building quantum formulas in a world way, like guessing oh my them. God. Wow. <laughs> so th there is fun stuff in that area. Okay. Okay. And that, that's the thing. See, you take an existing problem and you think about it from quantum computing perspective. Yeah. You know, it reminds me of. Like back when I was in computer science doing a uh, comp sci for a bachelor's degree, I remember like parallel programming was the thing that I would think about like concurrency and, you know, how you can run two things at the same time, you know, and having, you know, avoiding deadlocks and stuff like that. I feel like quantum computer is like the next step to that. Like you're, you're expanding your horizon a little bit and thinking in terms of completely different set of rules. Mm -hmm. Right. Is that okay? And and is that is that your favorite thing about quantum computing? It is one of my favorite things. Okay. So this way um, is how learning quantum computing is going to have immediate impact on you. I cannot go around and tell people that everybody should learn quantum computing because they're going to get a job using it. Mm -hmm. That just wouldn't be fair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I can tell people that doing this is going to make them better thinkers. And I genuinely believe this. Okay. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your career. What are the biggest challenges that you face to get where you are today? You know, and how did you overcome these challenges? Well, this is recorded and everything I say can and will be used against me, right? <laughs> That's what I always say in the beginning of Teams meetings that I have to record. <laughs> I'll tell you this much. I'll tell you why I'm asking the question. You probably know already, you know, um, you know, a lot of us sometimes when we are facing certain challenges, you know, uh, either in even entering the computer science kind of or, or tech industry or while you are in the tech industry, but you feel you kind of lost your way or, you know, you're not growing or going in any direction, right? a lot of us have this feeling that oh it's just me you know imposter syndrome oh it's just me i'm the only one who have this problem you know but when i bring pioneers like yourself and you kind of talk about challenges and people like this is all about kind of finding you know uh, people can relate to your experience <laughs> and say you know what i was in this place or i am in this place and look what maria did you know she really turned it around and she be basically became a principal uh, a software engineer on the quantum computing group you know at microsoft like i feel like you couldn't even get a cooler title than this you know <laughs> like this like that's like the kind of title you walk into any place and be like listen everyone 
you know, what do you do again, web development? I'm a quantum, I'm a principal engineer for quantum computing at Microsoft. So, so something like that, you know, did you, you know, I'm pretty sure you have ran into situations where you needed to overcome, you know, without having to mention any specifics if you don't want to, just so, so you, and I, you and I don't get in trouble. Go ahead. Okay, so relatable inspirational stories rather yeah. than actual <laughs> things that can be used against me. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's right. By the way, my title is by far not the coolest that you can have. There are yeah. uh, partner software engineers in quantum computing and distinguished engineers in quantum computing. You, you, so you know what I think? There I think is gonna, space to grow. I think I think in, in a couple of years, you're going to be the distinguished engineer in quantum computing. Maybe you'll be the highest title in this place. And, you know, I, I have no doubt. I see like a, a good spirit. You know, I see uh, I see dedication and passion and commitment. This doesn't seem like just a job to you, Maria, is it? Is a little bit more than that in there. Mm -hmm. ah, it would be silly to tell that it's just a job, given that in my spare time I write books about it and I teach a class about it. I started teaching another iteration of this class just earlier this week. That's right. So it would be a claim that I cannot really back up with any evidence. Right, right. So back to your question. Uh, yeah, some challenges. challenges. Yeah. So one challenge that I absolutely obviously faced when switching to a completely new domain was uh, learning this domain. Mm -hmm. I came in um, with some understanding of what is superposition and measurement based on that quantum physics course I took at the university a long, long time ago. Mm -hmm. But anything beyond that, any algorithms, any um, like anything you can do with those superposition and measurement mm -hmm. were completely new to me. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That one to overcome, well, you put in time. You put in time and you put in elbow grease and you practice and you try to implement things and to solve problems. And there's really no way around it other than to put in that time and effort. Did, did, did you ever have had moments where you were like, I can't do this. I'm not going to make it. Did you ever have moments like these? And what did you tell yourself to keep going? Well, usually I would tell myself that, well, I need this in a week. What are my options? <laughs> uh, pr when what? you prepare for a lecture that is due on Monday, you kind of don't have a lot of wiggle room. You yeah. have to you have be there and you have to talk highway. about this topic. <laughs> That's right. So you have to understand it. You have to know you know you, you have to know what it is okay so you you run into situations where you know it can be quite difficult but i only have so many so many options if if not more than one you know to kind of do that what what other challenges have you ever had to kind of endure you know to kind of overcome and be where you are today yeah another big challenge i faced when i uh, started discovering this passion for education and outreach mm -hmm. was that it turns out you cannot do education and outreach without public speaking. If you come up with incredibly cool software project like the quantum cutters, mm -hmm. well, you cannot just keep working on it quietly in the corner and hope that nope. it gets adopted. You gotta be really you have, loud. Mm -hmm. You have to go out and to talk to people about it and show mm -hmm. it, show them why it is so cool. Mm -hmm. And Intrinsically, I'm an introvert. Okay. You wouldn't be able to tell from talking to me now. Yeah, I, I was thinking the same thing. I mean, you're joking. You're, you're talking to me. Okay, that's a surprise. Keep going. I'm listening. Four years ago, it would be completely unthinkable to me to voluntarily stand up in front of a room and mm -hmm. talk to that room. Okay. It was incredibly scary. Okay. But then when I um, came up with this project, I had a great manager at the time, mm -hmm. wonderful manager. And uh, he kind of pushed me in this direction. He explained to me kind of how it works, that you cannot ask other people to talk about your project because it is your project. You are the person burning with passion about it, yep. not they. Yep. And he kind of lined up opportunities for me of increasing complexity. So the first one was, 
half a session, 15 minutes mm -hmm. at uh, a quantum computing session at a faculty summit that Microsoft hosted four years ago. Okay. So it would be a room of probably 20 people mm -hmm. who are kind of friendly. So they are external people, not from Microsoft, but they are kind of friendly to us. Yeah. And I, I practiced for it, I don't know, two weeks, a month. It was incredibly scary. Okay. Did you have to talk in the mirror to yourself, kind of see? <laughs> Just uh, firsthand? Oh, no, no, no. Did... If, if, I, if I looked at how I look when I speak, I wouldn't be able to do it. I, I, you... That part I have to not think about. What did you have to do to overcome that kind of challenge? Like, did you just kind of, what did you do? Tell me. <laughs> I don't know. I'm super extroverted, so I don't know. what. Like, what, what's an, a really, really amazing, intelligent, uh, introverted engineer had to do to kind of overcome the fear of public speaking? So it was practice, and it was practice in increasing chunks. So for that first talk, I prepared for it a lot. Like, I polished my slides and I worked with my manager to practice and to to go through it with him mm -hmm. and he gave me feedback so we spent a lot of effort on this okay. and then there is this heartwarming thought that <laughs> to which I attribute my later successes in public speaking okay. when we were in the actual room uh, it was a catered event of course okay. a wonderful breakfast I couldn't eat a single thing because okay. you know yeah. introverts yeah. don't yeah. eat before public speaking it's just okay. not anatomically possible okay <laughs> and they had bacon i love bacon i'm a carnivore okay <laughs> so i went ahead to prepare for my session um, and they started uh, taking the food away and then my manager gets up goes to that uh, breakfast spread and uh, piles up a plate of bacon Wow, okay. And it puts him in front of my place so that I have something to look forward to for after uh, I'm done. Oh, wow. Okay. That's that's sweet. That's really nice. And that's like a support, kind of supportive gesture, you know, in a yes. way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So I, I, I go through this talk. I probably didn't make any eye contact with anybody in the audience. Uh, that came up much, much later. Okay. But, but I got through it. And then the next opportunity he sent me to was an actual conference. So I had to fly somewhere. I had to talk to people with nobody I know in the room. Oh and I had to do okay. half an hour instead of 15 minutes. And I had to talk about not just my project, but something extra. Nice. And nice. then again, we spent time preparing for this. And it was super scary. But fortunately, that time the talk was before lunch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> and this way, step by step, um, eventually I built up to the point at which uh, I'm just fine talking to people. And just I had a chance to, to it. test it, mm -hmm. uh, to test that I haven't lost this skill uh, during the pandemic, because it's very different talking to my camera. Yep. Versus talking of, to yeah. 100 people who actually look at you and might not even look impressed. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I was, I always listen to like stand up, stand up comedians, right? They, there is a stand up comedy, but they also talk about all the work that goes behind, you know, uh, uh, speaking, telling jokes for an hour, for a whole hour. And people expect, you know, if someone doesn't like your joke, it's a lot, a lot harder. I think in your case, it's even harder than that, because in your case, you're talking about a, a very specific topic that's, you know, a, I don't know how many people out there, probably 100,000, maybe less than 100,000. I'd be surprised if it's a little bit more than that in the tech industry where, you know, software engineers are talking about quantum computing, you know, and you might bring up a topic that, you know, it, someone else really deeply researched it and they give you that kind of face expression. What do you do now? Like when you're when you're talking to a bunch of people live, like in front in front of them and someone gives you like a face expression, like, but like, you know, what are you talking about? What do you do? Like, how do you kind of overcome that? Mm -hmm. hmm. That's a good question. Uh, a lot of time I talk to audiences of students mm -hmm. and I talk about things about in which I most likely know more than they do. Mm -hmm. So I so usually if 
so usually the faces they make are the faces of lack of engagement and boredom rather than <laughs> no you know you're actually saying something stupid <laughs> I am going to a conference with proper quantum computing people at it next week, uh -huh. actually, I triple quantum week. Okay. We will see what happens there. We'll see how that goes. And and I and I'm wishing you the best in, in that in that conference. I think I think you'll do just fine. I think you'll do just fine. You know, if you can overcome kind of, you know, you know, you have your perseverance, right? You're entering a field you know you you know for especially like I, english is not my first language either so i don't think a lot of people really understand you know especially people born in the country you know that you know speaking a different language and speaking about a specific field in a different language and then excelling in that field and then having on top of that you know a fear of public speaking and then overcoming that you know it, it, for all i know you're a superhero you really have superpowers to kind of overcome that i think a lot of people kind of underestimate themselves you know and they go and say no i'm not going to be able to do it i want people to look at you and look at your story and learn from it and think you know i i can probably do it you know and i can probably you could have every disadvantage in the world but you could still overcome it and make it happen maria i have a question for you what advice do you want to give to new software engineers people that are entering the tech industry for the first time right people that may not be you know, uh, they, they may not have all the advantage in the world. People from all over the world, like in this YouTube channel, these videos go everywhere, every corner on earth, right? Uh, what do you have to say to these people? Or in other form, what, do, what advice do you have to say to your younger self? I would say while you're young, while you're strong and resilient, try different things. Try okay. a lot of different things and try to learn enough about them okay. and try things that don't necessarily um, that you don't necessarily see how they tie in into your current career mm -hmm. try programming competitions try open source development try doing projects on things that you don't work on okay. try doing things for people uh, not necessarily expecting something in return because this kind of things they're going to lead you to opportunities they're going yeah. to make you a better professional and they're going to give you opportunities you wouldn't get otherwise yeah. yeah a lot of the opportunities i got to do cool things such as write a book or such as teach a course at the university they come from somebody having worked with me on something that didn't necessarily seem important to me at that point Nice. But that person learned about me and, and they thought you. that I'm a great person for this. And when somebody mentions, oh, I wonder who could write a book or, oh, we need somebody to teach this course, this person thinks about me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. then, and then doing different things in different contexts gives you um, skills that you can then apply in different areas. Okay. Like I managed to apply my uh, programming competition skills in my work by organizing programming competitions about quantum computing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I applied my open source skills that I got before joining quantum computing team mm -hmm. to uh, grow a community around the quantum cartas. They nice. have over a hundred external contributors now. Nice. So nice. people who also figured out that they can do something yeah. for the field of quantum computing, not necessarily being experts in it. Yep. A lot of my contributors are students, people who are just learning themselves. Yep, yep. The quantum cottage. Yep. That's 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 how you're driving um, quantum computing everywhere. This is your you are you are busy on GitHub, you know, but you know what's what's more important than this? You're busy on GitHub, but you also balance your your work life, you know, you're always off. I always look at people like this. I'm like, okay, this is a person that has discipline. They'll go and say, you know what? I need to chill out over weekends. I, I need to do that too. I need to chill out too. You know, see, I'm, I'm not good at that. I, sometimes I go and be like, okay, you know, you know, but there's this crazy idea that we should do. And then the crazy idea takes over. That's not a healthy GitHub repository mm -hmm. profile. So wants to know my secret. 
What is your secret? <laughs> uh, the weekends for the past year and a half, I spent working on my book, which was not on GitHub. So uh, the work I did there doesn't show up here. <laughs> So on weekends, just switch to a different version control system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, Hassan, you want to know how I do it? I still, I still push code, but you just can't see it. You know, I just do it sneakily. Yes. <laughs> By the way, I, I really, truly, truly appreciate your sense of humor, and I appreciate, I appreciate your intelligence. I appreciate your contributions to the community and society. I think people like yourself who believe in open source and bringing, you know, some really complicated topics, you know, to the world, especially, you know, uh, uh, students, you know, in, in schools and, and people who are seeking knowledge everywhere, especially when you put in open source, that means you don't have to be super rich to kind of learn a, a complicated topic. You know, you could just go to GitHub and communicate with the community and actually bring that kind of knowledge out there. Um, Maria, you are, you are really awesome. And I wish you all success and happiness. This has been such a pleasure, you know, to just get down and, you know, listen to you and listen to your story and, and, and what you have to say. And, you know, just know like my podcast sometimes is event based. So what that basically means sometimes if, if quantum computing pops up, you're in my play, you know, kind of my phone book right now, you know, so I'm going to go reach out to you and be like, you know, I know someone that really, really loves quantum computing, you know, maybe they have a, a thing or two to say about this thing that's happening, you know, and, and 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 hopefully you know you would you would you would kind of entertain an idea like that um as usual pioneers like yourself like selfless pioneers people that want to kind of bring knowledge out there you know beyond their work hours beyond what you have to do for the job uh, are the people that are actually pushing the wheel of innovation forward they're the people that make you know this world a better place i don't think a lot of the innovations that we have today uh, were driven by ROI or, you know, value proposition or whatever the case may be. It was passion. It's something someone decided they want to learn how to fly and they jumped off a mountain. You know, you know, what happened to them next is not important. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sort of is. <laughs> we just think uh, the first part. You need to be story. careful be when careful. you pick your role models. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Um, Thank you so much for accepting my invitation. Just, just for people watching, you know, I invite a lot of people on my podcast. Maria is really, really gracious with her time. And she she said, you know what, I'm going to do it. You know, I didn't even know you were kind of introverted, you know, and you were like, you know, no, I don't feel comfortable. Maybe sometimes I don't. I'm practicing it and all that. Uh, I appreciate that so very much. Uh, any last remark from you before we wrap up? Oh, go buy Maria's book, right? I'm <laughs> telling you, if you don't buy Maria's book, I'm going to kick you off the channel. <laughs> you know? Do not, do not, do not let the day end before you buy Q Sharp Pocket for Maria, the pocket book for Maria. And I'm going to, I'm going to get like a signed copy and hopefully, you know, it's everywhere. Like you're, see? What's so? This is the one with the, with the green the green bird. I think they're all like that. Is there any different editions, or is it just this one? Just this one. Instant, and the bird is Quetzal. Instant help for Q Sharp developers, right? I you know go check out the book. I'm gonna get my signed copy from Maria because I can, and you know, and hopefully you know we'll get to learn more about quantum computing and. You know, maybe maybe you can start a series. You know, I always do that on on YouTube all the time. I start a series, and be like, hey, let's learn Q Sharp from scratch. Let's see what this is all about. You know, and we'll ask you questions if we run into problems. What do you think about that idea? Do you think that's a good idea? I'm going to need to think about it. I'm hey. practicing my not saying yes right away skill. Yes. This is the challenge I'm facing these days. So I'm trying to get better at this. <laughs> Sounds good to me. You know, well. You'll say yeah. We'll see. <laughs> anyway, yeah. any anything anything at all before we wrap up? Yeah, thank you for inviting me, and giving me another opportunity to practice my jokes. Good jokes, by the way. <laughs> Subtle but good. <laughs> I practice. Good. <laughs> I practice a lot. Awesome. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything else? 
No, that's, that's it. That's it. That's it. All right. And you know, for people watching us, you know, please go check out you know Maria's amazing contributions in the open source community. Check out her uh, 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 contribution in in contributions in quantum computing, Q sharp. You know, try it. Try it out. You know, give it a shot. You know, why not? If you're trying uh, things like Signal R and ASP.NET Core and you know C sharp, you know 10, you know, give this one a shot too and see you know, how, how you can go with it, maybe kind of expand your mind about the problems that we're solving and, you know, where technology is headed. And for the people watching us, as usual, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, please drop a comment in the comment section. Or if you have a compliment from Maria here, please make sure you kind of, you know, drop that. Go subscribe to her YouTube channel, follow her on, on Twitter and, and LinkedIn and GitHub. You know, and check out her amazing contribution as usual. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you so much. And I'll see you in another video. Take care. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> Bye.